pleasure to introduce to you Eric Jansen. For the past six years, Eric has been an analyst with the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, where he's been a scientific lead on pilot projects evaluating the performance of low-carbon technologies, focusing primarily on photovoltaics and on heat pumps. Prior to STEP, Eric worked in industry for Ecologics Heating Technologies, a small-scale manufacturer of innovative cold climate heat pumps. He's a certified measurement and verification professional and holds a Master's of Applied Science in Engineering, Physics, a Swedish Magister Examen in Solar Energy Engineering, and a Bachelor's Degree in Physics. Eric, could you uh, come on up? Hi everyone, thanks for having me here today. Uh, so my name's Eric Jansen, I'm an analyst with the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Uh, today I'm gonna be giving a really brief mini presentation on different heat pump technologies. Specifically, I'll be highlighting some recent research results from some local pilot uh, projects that we've conducted and focusing on the achievable cost and carbon savings of the technology. So I only really have time to talk about uh, the key findings, but if you're interested in learning more, I'll put up some resources at the end of the talk, or feel free to come chat with me at any point during the day today. So first, a little bit of an introduction to my organization. I work for the, uh, the STEP program. We're a not-for-profit research initiative within the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. We do research that supports the uptake of emerging low-carbon technologies in the field of building energy, renewable energy, and smart grid as well. A typical project for us would be to take a, an underutilized technology, for example, say a heat pump technology, put it in an actual building or in our laboratory facilities, the Archetype Sustainable House, and I have Terrell to thank for such a beautiful workspace, uh, and then measure its performance and report on the results in forums like this. And that's exactly the type of heat pump research that I'm going to be talking about today. I also just want to quickly acknowledge that the, uh, the research is the result of the support and collaboration from a number of other organizations, and uh, I want to thank them for their contributions. So I'm going to be talking about two projects. Uh, the first project is on ductless air source heat pumps. The jump off point for this research was some market analysis that was done by TAF, the Atmospheric Fund. They found that about a quarter of all multi-unit residential buildings in Ontario is heated with, are heated with electricity. Lion's share of that comes from electric baseboard heaters. Now this is a problem because it's expensive, um, it's inefficient compared to other options. These buildings typically don't have any central cooling or they rely on inefficient window shaker air conditioners and this is going to be a problem moving forward as we have to adapt to climate change. And they may, uh, this may constrain the grid and impact the electrification of other sectors like transportation. So for various reasons, uh, retrofitting these baseboard heating systems in this sector is a very important conservation opportunity. One technology that can completely offset an electric baseboard heating system is a ductless multi-split air source heat pump system. And I'm trying to show just a simplified schematic of what that might look like in a building here. On the left hand side we have a baseboard heating system, baseboards in each room or zone of the house, and the heating distribution system is of course essentially just the electrical wiring of the home. In a ductless multi-split system, uh, we have an outdoor condenser like we'd have with a conventional air conditioning system, and that's shown at the top. We'd have ductless indoor fan co coils installed in each room or zone of the home, and then we'd have some refrigerant piping to connect the whole system together. And how the system operates is it extracts renewable heat energy from the outdoor air and uses that to heat the home. Uh, and it can consume much less energy than a conventional baseboard heating system. If you look at the standardized performance ratings for this technology, this suggests that really deep energy uh, savings are possible. One of the things that we wanted to do is help uh, the uptake of this technology and develop some data that, that can show the savings in, in real world retrofits. Uh, and we installed several of these systems in an electrically heated row house complex located in, in Brantford, Ontario. And here's a picture of one of the retrofits. You can see the condenser mounted on the outside of the building. Uh, you can see the refrigerant lines run on the exterior. And that is connecting to some ductless indoor fan coils on, on the building's interior. 
So you can see that this would be a really straightforward retrofit technology because most of the work happens on the building uh, exterior and there's only some small building penetrations to, to connect to the inside of the building. It was minimally invasive to the tenants and easy for the contractors to do. The aim of our study uh, was to, to measure the energy savings. So in addition to uh, the heating equipment itself, we install a number of other sensors, data loggers, and other equipment to measure the savings over about a year of operation and calculated savings according to the IPMVP, or International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. Some high-level results are here. Uh, over about a year of operation, we found that the heat pumps reduced the total electricity bill uh, up to 32%. We found that the cooling energy was drastically reduced compared to window shaker air conditioners uh, five times, which was a number that, that surprised even us. Um, we estimated the annual energy savings of the equipment, about $850 per year. And throughout the monitoring period, we also uh, performed a number of interviews to, to try and gauge the tenant's experience with the technology, and it was overwhelmingly positive. So that was all great news. Uh, but the install cost for the technology is, is greater than $10,000, and that's going to vary with, uh, with different system types. And despite a very strong savings, it's not going to result in that uh, very short payback that many building owners might be looking for. At least not in our case study, results might be different in other buildings. So one of the things I think that we learned through this study um, is that the, the multi-split heat pump system is a more complex iteration of ductless heat pump technology. It provides a premium level of thermal comfort and that also comes at a, at a premium cost compared to other heat pump technologies. We think in hindsight, that for this application, where low cost would be a very important priority, that a, a simpler iteration of this technology would be better, a ductless mini-split uh, heat pump that would be used in conjunction with the existing baseboard heaters. Uh, it would cover most, but not all of the load. It would provide high efficiency cooling, and it would do uh, save energy, but at a fraction of the cost of the multi-split system. So we think in this context, simpler would make more sense. So I'm really going through quickly because I only have 10 minutes. That's, uh, that's that project. Uh, in the second project, we looked at, at gas-driven heat pumps. Um, the fact of the matter is that most buildings in Ontario are, of course, heated with natural gas. And that's just because natural gas provides a lot more energy for the same cost. And in many applications, or most applications, electrically driven heat pumps will have trouble uh, competing with a conventional gas heating system. But we saw that electrically driven heat pumps can achieve these really good energy savings. Um, what if it was possible to use heat pump technology to achieve that energy savings, but not have to switch to a higher cost fuel like electricity? And that's what led us to natural gas driven heat pumps. So this is a picture of a gas absorption heat pump. It's been installed at our Archetype Sustainable House lab since 2016. It's been doing all the heating for the lab and, and even the cooling. Uh, We've done a number of tests uh, on it over, over that time and uh, collected data on its performance. Uh, this is the only graph that I'm going to show. Uh, I'm trying to illustrate two things. This is a plot of the efficiency as a function of the outdoor temperature. Um, just to give you an idea, the sort of data that we've collected. There's two important trends here. The first one is that this gas absorption heat pump performs most efficiently in warm ambient temperatures. It also performs most efficiently at providing lower grade heat. Um, I would also point out that at its most efficient under ideal uh, conditions, it's operating at 136% efficiency. So this is, we, we're used to uh, a, a high efficiency boiler as being 95%. In certain conditions, this technology can give us 136% just because it's robbing some of that heat energy from the outdoor air. So we, we took that data and some, some other data that we collected and, and some temperature data and estimations about what, uh, what different building loads might look like and did some calculations to try and figure out where does this technology make the most sense. And it turns out that we think the best application in terms of cost performance is not an out-and-out -out replacement for a boiler or a conventional gas heating technology, but rather in combination with it. We think that domestic hot water preheating in, in, for example, a MERB or institutional or commercial building is a really excellent opportunity for this technology because the domestic hot water load occurs during the summertime. We have warm ambient conditions and preheating uh, because it's best at providing lower grade heat. 
In this application, both the, the cost and carbon savings are quite strong and sub 10 year paybacks might be feasible. However, in line with the overall theme of the talk today, uh, we're, adding, we're talking about adding a level of system complexity to this system. It's one more thing to control and manage. So trying to wrap this up uh, with the theme of the talk, in the first project we found that uh, increased complexity can have diminishing returns and that we think the best business case would be had with mini-split retrofits instead of the multi-split retrofits. In the second case, we found that having an increased level of system complexity can be necessary at all to be able to best utilize low-carbon technology and that it's sometimes much better as a complement to rather than a replacement for existing technology. So the not-so-exciting conclusion is that sometimes you require simplicity and other times you require complexity. Uh, the question is then when? How do you know? I don't have the complete answer, but my completely biased viewpoint in this matter is that it's worthwhile to invest in research. Uh, you can pilot new technology and measure data, and then that data can guide you in your decision making, and we can go to forums like this and share our results and together overall learn as a community. So that's the end of my talk today. Uh, thanks all for having me. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this project, some nice high-level summaries are available on the TAF 80 by 50 blog. Uh, you can see our website, sustainabletechnologies.ca. If you're a member of the Association of Energy Engineers, this has been published in, in their journal, the International Journal of Energy Management. You can contact me directly or just have a chat with me later on today. So thank you very much. Thank you.